Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Ariel Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Panath LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handrow Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. In the continuation of the story of the of you, Carey, one of our best governors in the state of New York, a great congressman, as told by his two sons, we continue on. I have today, needless to say, Michael Carey. Nice to see you again. And his brother, Christopher Carey. So we were in the middle of the time mom passes on, and then dad decides that he's going to run for governor. Well, let me back up a little. Michael, we have to say it's a pleasure uh, doing this at this particular time because in just a few weeks, April 11th, we'll be celebrating Hugh L. Carey's 100th birthday. So it's a good time for a reflection. So we talked about the congressional era. In 1972, my father had a very tough uh, election. It was Nixon was running against my governor, so a tough time for Democrats. And we had predominantly uh, conservative uh, uh, district to run. Uh, he ran well ahead of the ticket, uh, beat the uh, local politician named John Ganjemi. On the news that night, and it's particularly relevant because there's a wonderful documentary showing uh, on, on Breslin and Hamill. On the news that night, when it said that Hugh Carey had won re-election as congressman, Jimmy Breslin said, that's going to be the next governor of New York. So... And that was the last congressional race. Our mother had taken ill and she had been uh, discovered that she had breast cancer, had been receiving treatments here. They decided to move down to Virginia where she could get the best care at the National Institute for Health and my father, our father could be closer to home. But she had a dream that the best future for the family and for our father was to become governor of New York and have everyone live in the same house up in Albany, the governor's mansion. And although she knew what her fate ultimately was going to be, she said that she would be there with him as first lady of New York. So she passed away in March of uh, 1974. 74, uh, uh, but our father had promised her that he would go ahead and, and seek that office. For and he's family. elected in November of 74? That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I also want to go back a couple of things, just, sure. to, just to highlight it. You know, because he was in the House for 14 years, and he was the, the initial sponsor of something called the First Ever Elementary and Secondary Aid to Education Act, which allowed for federal aid to flow to, to um, if you will, private schools, okay? But there was a great little uh, vignette in that, uh, in what unfolded over maybe a, a year or so. Johnson 
wanted to ha help the church, help the Catholic schools, help the private schools. Um, and so he dubbed Hugh Carey to do that because he knew of Hugh Carey's role within Brooklyn and so forth and being Catholic. But uh, there's a great phone conversation as K Johnson is enlisting Carey to do this. And my father was, of course, willing to do it. But he said, Mr. President, there's something that I'd like to take up with you, if you don't mind. And John said, well, what would it be, Mr. Carey? And he said, well, there's something over here called the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really been a um, terrific, terrific job generator for the city of New York. And I understand it's slated for, for, for closure. And that re really wouldn't sit well with my constituents. So it would be a lot easier for us to sell this elementary and secondary eighth education if I were able to talk about how the president has allowed the Brooklyn Navy Yard to stay open. So fast forward many, many years, as I'm sure you know, being a student of New York government and, and what's happened, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is now one of the greatest job generators. It's got WeWorks, it's got all sorts of new tech companies. You got so, Steiner so, Studios, you have That's everything. correct. So little known fact, the Brooklyn Navy Yard was saved by you, Carrie, as part of the intersection with Lyndon Johnson Look, or uh, Aid well, Education. Another thing is Willowbrook. So, my father visited Willowbrook. Geraldo Rivera, well known, had done an expose on Willowbrook. There was a special prosecutor. There was a Stein Commission looking into corruption in the uh, nursing home business and in the disabled community. You know, lots of, there's lots of federal money, lots of state money available to these places, but oftentimes they're, they're often, their populations are left and neglected. And my father went out to Willowbrook and um, uh, one of the first things he did upon being elected governor was sign the Willowbrook Consent Decree, which, in a sense, was was the harbinger of reform for some of these some of these um, facilities that were that were sort of in the dark. Brought, brought transparency, brought light, brought accountability to these places, and it was a huge, huge thing. That was one of his proudest moments because it helped um, to bring uh, some some relief to to a very needy community. Ironically, many, many years later, when I was head of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, I built a baseball stadium for the Staten Island Yankees on the Willowbrook campus, which subsequently became the College of Staten Island. So it came full circle as a place where, where people were actually able to, to learn and to, and to engage in athletic facilities as opposed to an institution for the disabled. I mean, he went into a time when the city was bankrupt over there. Correct. Correct. Yeah, you know, but, it's, every, but, but it's when he took office. Right. Yes. Uh, the famous quote is, you know, the days of wine and roses are over. The, the city was on the verge of bankruptcy and the state was in, right. in, in very difficult condition. Well, I'm sure you know, Michael, that uh, Rockefeller um, uh, gained support among the construction trades by being a great builder. So my father had a terrific expression. He said that Rockefeller had the champagne and I got the hangover because it wasn't long after my father got in as governor in 1975 that he was told that the Urban Development Corporation was having financial troubles. Shortly thereafter, he was also told that the city of New York was having a problem. I'm sure you know that the city borrows money in anticipation of tax revenues, but the city was unable to access the capital markets, which basically means that the city... Was bankrupt. Was bankrupt. Was, right. well, was, was, effect Unverged. was effectively... Illiquid and had no ability to pay people. So, within months of his becoming governor in 1975, which was an upset, by the way, a lot of history going on at the time. If you remember, Richard Nixon resigned, Gerald Ford became president. Gerald Ford tapped Rockefeller, then governor of New York, who had presidential ambitions for the longest time, had run, became vice president. Um, so a Malcolm little known, Wilson became the. Yeah, a little known man named Malcolm Wilson, Irish Catholic also became governor of New York. And um, apropos of what Chris had said, what Jimmy President said, one of my father's uh, political mentors, uh, Joe Danahy, was that his name? Joe Danahy. Jim, said, Jim Delaney, the congressman, and said, uh, Joe said, Danahy. They said, had wait your time, but at some point, there'll be an opportunity to run against Malcolm Wilson. But well, we have to go back a little bit, too, and to sort of bring back to it. Michael and I participated in the book about the man who saved New York. Right. The governor would tell his stories. But it's uh, sort of you start in media rays and you go back, then you go forward. We didn't talk too much about the uh, the gubernatorial election, the primary, and Howard Samuels was the odds-on favorite uh, to to win. Uh, uh, the, our father announced his candidacy, and all of us in the family participated in the campaign. We went 
we toured the entire state, uh, sometimes on our own as, uh, as speakers, like our mini speakers bureau on behalf of the candidate. But we toured uh, up, upstate in a, mm -hmm. in a Winnebago and uh, made all of the stops. And uh, as a result, the primary, again, Howard Samuels was the odds on favorite. The governor swept the state with the exception of one county. Won every county, it would have been a sweep except for Broome County, went for, went for Samuels. And that night, uh, the night of the victory, they called it very early. Pete Hamill, again referring back to President Hamill, was with us, with us that night at the Commodore Hotel for the celebration of, uh, of the victory. And he's making a speech, and Pete wrote about the people who came out of the subway uh, and after working day and voted for their guy, Hugh Carey and made a great acceptance speech for as being uh, awarded the nominee. And with that, the band struck up and Pete wrote, Chris Carey grabbed two blondes and danced a Lindy in the middle of the ballroom. Well, one of them was my wife, Bonnie. So it was a very important <laughs> occasion. And we, we got married uh, just a few months later. Now, speaking of uh, the family getting involved, I mean, later on, uh, the governor was considered one time the bellhop in the hotel. There, there was a summer where uh, we have... We, summer of 75, the first summer he was thinking. Summer of 75. We've been fortunate that our father uh, took us out to Shelter Island. Uh, Before they were on the Long Island Expressway. The, the expressway only went as far as Smithtown. Then you had to take the, uh, the, uh, the road, main road through the farms. We started going there in 1952. We would rent for a few weeks to a month every summer. And then eventually uh, we bought our own home. Uh, which is, is still there. It's been modified uh, quite a few times with the expansion of the family. Uh, Michael and I have our own homes out there, as do uh, two of our sisters. But let's talk about Ramshead. So the summer that the governor had been elected, I just got married. The house was under construction. So we decided to rent the Ramshead Inn on Shelter Island, and we would live there and work there. So Michael was the day-to-day -day manager. Uh, some of our brothers were bartenders. This was sort of a, just a moment in time where the Ram's Head was available. Uh, it was not for sale, but we could rent it for the summer and make, make it into so, a uh, place. So, 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 so everybody, rented it. everybody had a job, including right. your father. Every, and everybody every, every, had a home because we needed a place to live. So we all bunked up on the third floor. I think my father had one of the guest rooms on the second floor. But it really was, it was sort of like a marriage of you know, Chris's dream to run, run a place like that and have it, and, and then the necessity of some place for us to stay in Shelter Island. So I, know you, I know you want this story. So it's a, it's a Saturday afternoon, and the governor is in the little foyer of the place, right by Michael, and one of his top administrators is there, and a couple come in to check in. Uh, Michael <clears throat> goes to check them. They put their luggage down. My father takes the luggage. I'll take that for you, and he brings it upstairs. The administrator, who was on the same, you know who just took your luggage up the upstairs? He goes, that's the governor of New York. So my father comes down, and the, the gentleman says, Governor, what an honor you checked my bags. Forget about that. Where's my tip? <laughs> so, <laughs> so part of the formula there was that we had the lovely Mary O'Dowd, yes, yes. who would perform on weekend evenings uh, at, at the Rams Head Inn. But that also involved the family. Our sister Nancy would get up and do a few numbers. Mm -hmm. Paul would Paul. sing Puff the Magic Dragon. And then, of course, the last set, the governor came out and would sing New York, his repertoire, New York. New York, New York, Won't You Come Home, Bill Bailey, uh, the, the, the whole thing. But, but it, was only, it was a legend, but it was only one summer. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your lives, okay? You're the older brother, and then we're right. going to talk about the younger brother. Tell me, you were born in 1947. 1947, right, right. So uh, the oldest son, I got into the restaurant hospitality business really starting in the summers out in Shelter Island. I walked, worked for a Swiss innkeeper, Carlotto Franzoni, had a, the Cheekwood Inn. I was a busboy, then became a server. Uh, then subsequent years, I was a bartender at the Gardner's Bay Golf Club, which uh, uh, is now the country club out there. Uh, worked in saloons there. I went to college up in Niagara Falls, worked in restaurant and bars there. So I got a business degree, 
but what I really appreciated uh, going to school was the hospitality business. And uh, I was fortunate uh, to get a job at the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, I figured with my college business degree and all my experience, I'd go right to the top. Well, I started, uh, started there my first day. They gave me a white coat. I went down to the loading dock to, you know, to receive fish and uh, learn the back of the house. It was a great experience for me. So I learned quite a bit there eventually moved into the catering department there at the Waldorf. Uh, uh, so my total Waldorf career, mainly in the catering department, booking a lot of business, a lot of great events, and it's a great institution. Unfortunately, it's closed now. Hopefully it'll be open in a few years. We'll see. But uh, I was there about seven years. Uh, then for a couple of years, I had a restaurant on 63rd Street and got a call after running that, I had sold my interest to uh, another restaurateur. I got a call to um, speak to the people at Sheridan, uh, and I was fortunate to go to the St. Regis and run their catering and food and beverage operation. And I did that for about 10 years till they closed for uh, a three-year renovation. At that point, I got an opportunity to join a newly formed group that was opening restaurants in the World Financial Center. Again, the financial which is interesting, especially Battery since Park City. Battery Park City is the World Financial Center, which that was responsible. Well, it had come come to being because when when Battery Park City was having its issues, and uh, they had to broaden the use and uh, uh, what the facilities could be used for, and the Reichman family was enticed to build the World Financial Center. So we opened this company opened four restaurants and a catering company. We took care of corporate food service for one of the tenants there. We opened the Hudson River Club, Edward Moran Bar and Grill, and I was there with that group for about 10 years. So, And then? Then uh, I got a call uh, to go meet with Joe Baum and David Emil. And they, were, they had the contract to reopen Windows on the World. It closed after the uh, explosion in 93, and they were reopening. So I signed on uh, with them for a year uh, and helped them get that open. I also worked with them. I worked with Windows on the World Trade Center Club and the, uh, um, at the Rainbow Room, the Rockefeller Center Club. So, but after a year, uh, I decided to go to work with someone you know very well, Nick Valenti at uh, Restaurant Associates, uh, and I was with them for about 10, 10 years or so, mainly uh, overseeing performing arts venues, Kennedy Center, Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, uh, the Metropolitan Opera, uh, Severance Hall in Cleveland. We actually had the open the, f the food service facilities at the Intrepid, so a broad uh, 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 array of different facilities I was involved with there. Then. Uh, I got a call out of the blue from a past president of uh, the Harmony Club of New York, one of the oldest, actually the second oldest so social club in, in the city, founded in 1852, and they had a general manager there. He'd been there about 33 years, and he was going to retire, and they were looking for a replacement. They told me they interviewed 65 people, and the outgoing general manager said, of all the people they interviewed, he says, I told them they should take you. And he said, I'm telling you, if they offer you the job, take it. <laughs> so, so he wasn't wrong. And it, it's been my fortune to have been the general manager there for 15 years, up until uh, just a few months ago when I've been now succeeded by a very capable uh, woman, uh, Davina Weinstein. Who, uh, Davina had worked with me almost my entire tenure uh, at, at the Harmony Club. So she's now the general manager and I'm the executive director working on special projects for the club. Now let's talk about your brother, the lawyer. All right, so I was born in 1950. I mean, you're, you're the lawyer, the I was born in 1953. Um, you know, I've spent my uh, formative years on the streets of Brooklyn, uh, went to St. Brendan's, which Christopher alluded to earlier, then went to St. Xavier's when the family shifted over to when my father was reapportioned to, uh, to uh, Park Slope. Um, it was a very in high school. My Chris had mentioned that we had moved down to Virginia and, uh, in connection with my mother getting treated for cancer at the National Institutes of Health. So, so between my summer 
the summer of my junior and senior year, I wound up graduating um, or moving to Langley, Virginia and graduating from um, Langley High School in McLean. Um, I then attended Catholic University in Washington, D.C. And if you remember, this, the late 60s, early 70s was a very turbulent period in the U.S., particularly in Washington with, the, with the, the Vietnam War coming to an end, Nixon's resignation, these sorts of things that were just every day in the papers. So I, no surprise, was a political science major interested in politics. My father was in Congress. I actually um, uh, arranged for my father to come lecture at the school at one of my political science classes. So I just, I just love politics uh, full time, all the time. Um, I returned to New York uh, to go to law school at Fordham Law School um, with the idea that one day I'd go into politics in one way, shape or form. Um, that didn't happen right away. I, um, I went uh, to a law firm by the name of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton and Garrison, which had a pretty storied history in terms of, of, of politics and people there. Ted Sorensen, for example, one of uh, John Kennedy's top uh, aides and speechwriters, was a senior partner there. Uh, Arthur Lyman. Arthur Lyman. Uh, Judge Rifkin, uh, uh, interestingly enough, had been an aide to um, uh, Senator Wagner, the, the, the father of Mayor Wagner, and who, who wrote the National Labor Relations Act. And, and Judge Rifkin, as he was respectfully known, actually resigned from the bench to, to join this law firm. So I was privileged to be associated with that law firm for about six or seven years, and then segued into a career for of uh, investment banking for a little while, doing structured finance projects, products. That was with Cambridge? That was Cambridge, which was, which was sort of the, formed out of the uh, municipal bond division of First Boston, which was then affiliated with Credit Suisse, which through a mutual friend of ours and my brother Donald, who you know, and Donald's group had done this, and they had asked me to get involved. And I, as the lawyer, got them their NASD license and put together their Articles of Incorporation, their LLCs, formed the whole thing. They were so impressed with the caliber of the work that I did, they asked me to join them. Unpaid, of course. As, as I said, unpaid. After, as, after a certain <laughs> amount of time, I convinced them that either they would pay me or I was going to leave. Dad to carry would Yeah, something, something about, uh, about paying. Dad go. wouldn't work for nothing. Paying go. So... so, so we ultimately worked everything out. I'm just kidding, but uh, but but I I uh, learned a lot about finance there and did some good things and we had some fun times and it was a great great um, entrepreneurial exercise. But but I had an opportunity in 1997 to go down and join something called the New York City Economic Development Corporation as first executive vice president and general counsel. So it was a great opportunity for me to bring to the fore my skills as a lawyer my skills as a negotiator, um, some real estate experience that I picked up over the years, uh, my financial experience with structured finance projects because I also became general counsel to the New York City Industrial Development Agency. So um, I am a Democrat. I, am, I was raised a Democrat. It's in my DNA to, dem to be a Democrat. I want to mention just real quick that um, Ronald Reagan was a Democrat and became a Republican. Uh, Rudy Giuliani was a, was a Democrat and became a Republican. But I am still a Democrat to this day, even though I've worked in, in two Republican administrations, one Giuliani, one Bloomberg. Um, but I, I think that the experiences that I had at the Economic Development Corporation were fantastic. I mean, the things that we did to help the city to grow and to prosper economically. Uh, I was involved with many, many of the deals around the uh, renovation, transformation of Times Square. Um, we induced six million square feet of office space there. Reuters, Ernst & Young, uh, we rebuilt the ferry terminals north, you know, Whitehall Terminal as well as Staten Island. Uh, Chris mentioned the food, food and beverage business. We moved the Fulton Fish Market up to the Bronx, which allowed for the South Street Seaport area to be redeveloped in, in a more um, valuable way. Um, I sound like I'm retiring. He sounds like he's running for office. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> so, so I called it the Roaring Nineties. It was fantastic. The, I had so much fun that that when I went to work for Mr. Bloomberg uh, in his first term, I, you know, I decided when I was going to leave there and go back to the p private sector. I didn't want to go back to practice law. I work. I liked working with developers. It was nice to see projects come and to that's fruition. That's when you created the Carry. And I created the Carry Group around 2004. And so since 2004, so going on about 15 years now, 
we have helped a variety of developers um, realize their projects throughout the five boroughs of the city of New York. So we've worked on such uh, things as the Barclays Center, um, uh, mutual friend of ours, uh, Lester Petraka Triangle Equities has done Flappish Junction, The Hub, a couple of other projects in New York that we worked on, uh, Staten Island. We um, help developers to respond to RFPs, to, um, to uh, help get through the process, uh, whatever that may, may mean, financing, land use, other complications, building departments. So I love politics. I love the marriage of politics and development. So it's something that I've got a great passion for, I enjoy, and it allows me to intersect with, with, with illustrious people such as Michael Stoller. I just want to bring out, there's the Cary Foundation, which does work on cancer research and other programs. And I mean, today, how many grandchildren? How many, what's? Well, the, the, so I have six grandchildren, but the total number of uh, great grandchildren to, attributed to QL Cary is, Getting close to 30? I would say 30 ish, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, as we will celebrate your dad's 100th birthday on April 11th, I April think. April 11th, yeah. yes. It'll be a great tribute because we told the story of the Carey family, the Carey sons, a great legacy, and thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having us.